Good morning or uh, good afternoon for some, I guess. I'm Matt Adams, a uh, partner in the San Francisco office of Kathleen Kirsch and Rockwell. Um, I'm an environmental lawyer by training with a particular focus on environmental review laws like the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. And much of my work is in Indian country, both on tribal economic development matters where the focus is really on minimizing the friction that NEPA can cause and also on matters that um, involve the protection of tribal resources, where NEPA is uh, an important tool um, to slow things down and make sure an appropriate result uh, can be obtained, um, give tribal stakeholders a, a say in the use of lands that might be outside of their current land holdings, but uh, nonetheless contain important resources. So um, really glad to be with you today to talk about uh, some significant regulatory changes to the NEPA framework. And especially glad, in fact, because I'm joined by my partner, Sarah Dutchke. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Dutchke, uh, also a partner with Kaplan Kirsch and Rockwell's San Francisco office. I'm happy to be joining you today. Like Matt, I spent most of my legal practice working in Indian country um, on issues involving tribal governance, um, litigation, and of course, fee to trust process, which is uh, um, directly implicates NEPA issues. And we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, I also serve as the current uh, elected chairperson of the Ion Band of Miwok Indians of California, a tribe in the Sierra Nevada foothills, uh, not too far outside of the city of Sacramento. All right, so you may have all heard that last year for the first time um, in something like 40 years, um, CEQ published new <clears throat> regulations governing uh, the NEPA process. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about those regulations today as well as NEPA's role in, you know, in the context of Indian country. Um, NEPA is really rather uniquely tied to Indian country, both, you know, operating, um, in ways to protect tribal cultural resources, but also creating some challenges uh, for tribes as they um, restore trust lands or engage in development projects on tribal trust lands. Um, of course, first, uh, NEPA touches pretty much anything that a tribe would like to do with its trust lands where some sort of federal decision-making process is involved. This includes anything from you know, large-scale gaming project development and determinations of gaming eligibility all the way to you know a simple lease of land to a neighboring property owner or a cattle grazer um, all of these issues implicate um, nepa all of these processes implicate uh, nepa issues um, and so nepa is incredibly important in the context of tribal trust lands uh, nepa is also a pivotal part of the fee to trust process um, this is especially true in california where tribes are very much working to restore trust lands, um, but also true all over the nation as tribes bring land into trust both within reservation boundaries and outside of reservation boundaries. NEPA is almost always implicated in those transactions. It is usually the most costly part of the fee-to-trust process, the most time-consuming part of the fee-to-trust process, and often the most litigated part of the fee-to-trust process. So very important. Um, and then, of course, NEPA is actually very important for tribes in the context of protecting tribal resources, um, allowing tribes to be important stakeholders and participants uh, in determination surrounding projects that impact on tribal cultural and other resources. And that dual role in Indian country is really important um, that Sarah just mentioned. We're going to come back to that a few times in this presentation, I've got a feeling. Um, but the other part of the context, of course, is you know, what specifically that dual role includes. What does NEPA really require? Um, now, we are not going to go into significant detail on this. We've been asked to focus on the regulatory amendments um, rather than doing sort of a, a NEPA 101 type of seminar. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you have those sorts of how do I make NEPA work for my project questions and our um, our contact is uh, going to be included at the end of the uh, presentation, but for right now, maybe we'll just sort of summarize it a bit, just to level set. 
Um, so NEPA is one of those environmental laws where the process is really the focus, right? It's not like federal pollution control statutes, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, that tell you how many parts per million can come out of your drain pipe or your smokestack. Not really like CERCLA or RICRA, um, federal laws that speak to who's responsible for cleaning up contamination. Instead, it's built around this idea that if you make sure federal decision makers have environmental information on the table when making their decisions, and if you give public access to the decision making process, you will very naturally end up with better environmental outcomes. The essence of this idea is sometimes referred to as the quote unquote hard look requirement. This is the general idea that uh, agencies have to identify, evaluate, disclose, and consider alternatives to the environmental impacts of their proposed action. Um, that is one major category of NEPA requirements. The other, of course, being the requirements that focus on what sort of public notice and engagement and participation is required. Um, how do you comply? What does a compliance path look like? Uh, there are three basic pathways, each one with its own set of uh, requirements. For projects that fall into categories of minor actions that will have no, can have no um, significant impact on the environment, normally the compliance mechanism is a categorical exclusion, um, often referred to as a CE, minimal analysis, minimal public process. For projects on the other end of the spectrum, where there will be assuredly significant environmental impacts, the compliance mechanism is an environmental impact statement or EIS. This is the most comprehensive analysis, the most public process. And then for projects that are somewhere in the middle, normally you're talking about um, an environmental assessment or EA, which um, can be pretty much anything from a, a short overview to something that looks like an old phone book, um, depending on what kind of project you're looking at. But if you look at the statute itself, 42 USC 43322, you know, you won't see any specific requirements for any of those three compliance mechanisms. Instead, almost all of the specifics, the whole process that we normally refer to as NEPA, comes from regulations that are issued by the Council on Environmental Quality, um, CEQ, as Sarah mentioned. And those regulations apply to all federal agencies, government-wide, um, including, but not limited to, Interior. Now, as Sarah mentioned, the, the regulations were first issued in the late 1970s, and somewhat incredibly, they survived with only one substantive change for 40 years. Um, I don't know of any other federal environmental regulations that you could say that about. Um, but during that time, there were always stakeholders who wanted major pieces of the regulations either scrapped or reinforced. Um, environmentalists who felt like the regulations were not stringent enough, industry groups who felt like the whole thing was a waste of time, and as a general matter, tribal stakeholders sort of fell on both sides of that um, dispute, um, depending on their circumstances and depending on the issue. You know, some wanted more NEPA, some wanted less. Um, last year, the Trump administration decided that it would be the one to finally comprehensively rewrite the regulation. Um, and we got a full package of 2020 amendments to CEQ's NEPA implementing regulation. What are those changes? Um, I think, Sarah, we would probably need three or four hours <laughs> to run through every last one. Uh, I'm not sure I know of a single section of the regulations that was untouched. Um, you know, some of the changes look really big and they are in fact really, really big. Uh, others look big, but honestly, they probably won't make that much difference. And then still others pretend to be minor wordsmithing, but they're actually gonna have a pretty major impact if they go into effect. So. Um, a lot there is the bottom line. And what we've decided to do here, since we're only with you for uh, about 45 minutes, is to try and summarize a few of the most important big picture items, which I'll run through quickly here. Um, and then once I'm done, Sarah will focus on some of the, the um, items that specifically um, call out tribal stakeholders. So first big picture issue. There's this um, question of threshold determination. Before 2020, 
NEPA generally applied to all discretionary federal decision making. Um, the 2020 amendments create more wiggle room for so-called small federal handle projects. These are projects where the federal approval is just a very small part of the overall thing. Um, and the 2020 amendments um, provide federal agencies with a way to make a determination that no NEPA, um, no NEPA review is required at all um, because the handle is so small. Um, second, the 2020 amendments make some significant changes to the scope of the environmental issues that are considered under NEPA. I think the biggest of those changes is to eliminate the concept of cumulative impacts in other words, these are the impacts of the project together with the impacts of other past, present, and reasonably foreseeable um, future actions. And that is particularly important, and it's gotten a lot of press because it would preclude consideration of most, if not all, climate change impacts. Third, um, some important changes to the determination of significance. So you probably noticed a moment ago that significance is at the core of the question of which NEPA document, which compliance pathway is going to be required, a CE, an EA, or an EIS. The former regulations listed a whole series of specific factors that had to be considered when evaluating significance. And over time, those factors, you know, as they were interpreted by the courts, gave everyone a pretty good sense of, for example, what kind of project would likely require an EA, which type of project would likely require an EIS. And there was this sort of, um, kind of trade knowledge of how to configure your project so that it would fit as neatly as possible within the lowest um, level of review. Um, the 2020 amendments do away with all of that. They eliminate the specific factors, they replace them with sort of a general mandate to consider environmental setting and degree of effect, which I think at minimum will very substantially unsettle all stakeholder expectations about what is required in the way of NEPA documentation. And I would expect that unsettled period to last for, for several years um, and require the federal courts to get involved and sort of um, uh, reestablish a, a common law of NEPA on some of these issues. Um, fourth, some small but important changes to the scope of the requirement to consider alternatives to a federal action. So the former regulation said an EIS has to consider all reasonable alternatives, even if they're not within the jurisdiction of the federal lead agency. The 2020 amendments say that an EIS only has to consider a reasonable range of alternatives and that an alternative outside the lead agency jurisdiction is not, in fact, reasonable. This set of changes, which have gotten a lot of attention, um, involves setting time and page limits for EAs and EISs. So the idea being to try to make the, the process work faster. Um, some of you are well aware that Interior has been trying something similar for several years now on the basis of a secretarial order. I think the general consensus is that that has not worked particularly well. Um, remains to be seen whether um, CEQ's proposal to try something similar um, will have better success here. Uh, sixth category of changes, you know, the role of the project proponent in an EIS. The former regulation said an EIS can only be prepared by the lead agency or by an environmental consultant hired by and acting for the lead agency. Uh, 2020 amendments say an EIS can be prepared directly by the project proponent or an environmental consultant, presumably working for the project proponent. Um, there are heightened standards for comments on a NEPA document, um, standards that get into specificity and timing, um, and those carry with them a way for agencies to avoid claims that they fail to respond to all public comments. That is new. And then last but not least, um, the 2020 amendments eliminate all prior CEQ guidance and agency-specific procedures. Um, some of you will have um, been familiar with the fact that in addition to CEQ's regulations, which apply government-wide, um, Interior and BIA each have their own NEPA procedures. Those 
according to the 2020 amendments would be withdrawn and replaced with something new. Okay, that was a lot um, all at once. We'll circle back to some of them, don't worry. Um, but in the meantime, Sarah, I don't know, do you want to pick up some of the more specific changes that mention um, tribes in a, a more particular way? Sure, sure. Thanks, Matt. So as, as Matt mentioned, some of the changes um, that came with the 2020 amendments include specific changes calling out tribal stakeholders. Uh, by and large, these, these are pretty good um, and positive for Indian country. Um, the first of them is that the word tribal has basically been added any time you find the word state or local government with regard to the notice and comment requirements under NEPA. Um, this is actually great. It, well, it generally puts into practice what's been happening in recent years. Um, it is pretty protective of tribal stakeholders' involvement in the process, ensuring that appropriate consultation with tribal governments occurs um, when uh, tribal resources or, or tribal interests are affected. Um, the next, um, and this is also quite positive, um, is the regulations eliminate language that suggested that tribal interests are limited to reservation lands. Um, this is incredibly important for the protection of tribal resources in places like California and other states where tribal trust lands make up a very small part of the lands that otherwise contain important tribal resources. So a huge change, incredibly positive in terms of, you know, tribal stakeholders having a voice um, on lands that are outside of reservation or trust lands. Um, finally, there's also a new reference in the regulations to tribal environmental standards. Um, this is pretty important. As Matt mentioned in the previous slide, um, really what, you know, the heart of, ICWA, of, of NEPA is a determination of the significance of a particular project on the environment. And that determination um, tells us what level of review we're going to engage in for purposes of the NEPA analysis. Um, what's important with these new changes is tribes' environmental standards are now important in making that significance determination. Um, so tribal interests, the way that the tr that tribes view the environment um, and consider it appropriate to care for the environment or to look at projects um, and, and their effect on tribal resources and the environment as a whole is now an important part of the NEPA process. Uh, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about the indirect um, amendments that bear on Indian country? Yeah, I, we can do this real quick because um, you know, I think the point to be made here is that some of the big picture changes um, from the last slide may have a disproportionate effect on tribal stakeholders, right? So even though they don't call out tribes or tribal organizations or tribal resources by name, they nonetheless can be expected to have a um, particularly large impact in Indian country. You know, one example of that is the heightened standards for commenting, you know, are likely to hit tribal governments and tribal organizations a little bit harder than they hit, you know, well-funded industry groups that um, can call on deeper staff resources um, to meet the new standards. Perhaps not surprisingly then, um, in light of the significance of the changes, the fact that they um, sort of both directly and indirectly um, affect all sorts of different um, stakeholder groups that have been very active in the rulemaking process, you know, these 2020 amendments triggered litigation, um, not just sort of speculative, uh, you know, fire off a complaint type of litigation, but extremely well-funded um, and, uh, and thorough facial challenges to the regulations themselves. Now, we are recording this on February 22nd. Um, you know, as of this moment, there are five different facial challenges to the regulations in four different federal courts. Um, that may change between now and March. Um, if it does, please accept our apology. Um, tribal rights have been invoked on both sides. Um, so, for example, in one of the cases pending in the Northern District of California, you know, the 
attorneys general of something like 20 states plus the territory of Guam have alleged, among other things, that the regulations are facially invalid because they were not the product of appropriate government-to-government -government consultation. Then on the other hand, uh, you know, in the case pending in federal district court in Virginia, you have a tribal stakeholder that filed a, an amicus or friend of the court brief saying that it fully supports the 2020 amendments because it will um, lighten the burden um, on economic development activities that are conducted on trust land. Um, there's also this question of updating agency procedures. Um, very few agencies have taken public steps here. It's interesting, um, you know, the exception being the Department of Transportation. But um, for most others, we are still in this you know, sort of twilight zone um, where the 2020 amendments say agency procedures and guidance are withdrawn, and there isn't a whole lot there to replace them. Um, and then I guess the last piece of the puzzle here in thinking through where the situation stands today, you know, some of you have seen the so-called Biden-Harris hit list. Um, this was a list of Trump era actions that the Biden-Harris transition team identified as being things that they wanted to uh, conduct some further review on during the first few months of the new administration. One of the items on that list was an executive order um, referring to one federal action, which sort of sets up the principles that underlie a lot of these 2020 regulatory amendments. And another item on there was the 2020 amendments themselves. Um, so there is good reason to think um, that uh, the administration generally and CEQ in particular um, is thinking hard about um, whether and how to walk back some or, or maybe even all of these regulatory amendments. Um, and in fact, for that reason, the Trump administration has successfully stayed four of the five pieces of litigation I mentioned earlier. The fifth one, for um, reasons that are uh, not entirely clear, uh, seems to be proceeding. Um, uh, and uh, we may be able to update you on that again before March. In the meantime, though, um, you know, we figured lots of uncertainty about um, whether the 20, oops, sorry about that, whether the 2020 amendments will survive, uh, if so, in what form, um, what to do if you've got a project at this moment <laughs> and you're trying to work it through the federal uh, bureaucracy. And we figured that, you know, maybe we just sort of kick it back and forth a little bit and talk through some of those questions. Um, I don't know, Sarah, you want to... <laughs> You want to go first there? Sure. Well, maybe I'll start by asking you a question. And I okay. think about this, you know, um, based on questions we've gotten from our own clients, but also as a tribal leader that has some projects pending in the queue. Um, in terms of, you know, this short term uncertainty, um, how might tribes address that right now while we're while we're waiting for some certainty surrounding this process? Yeah, that is that is the question. It really is. Um, what do you do if you have a pending project? You've got one set of regulations that's in effect, but the administration is giving you signs that they're not going to last forever. Um, you know, which set of standards do you follow? A couple of thoughts there. Um, one, generally speaking, I think to manage your litigation risk, I would not advise relying exclusively on the 2020 amendments. Um, I just, all the indications are that um, you know, it would be a mistake to depend on those being around um, for an extended period of time in their entirety. Some elements of them may, may survive. And um, you know, if you have questions about that, again, those would be things we're more than happy to answer um, if you use the, our email addresses in the bios. But um, as a general matter, um, I would not count on them surviving in their entirety. Um, two, to keep your project moving forward, I think it's going to be important to take the initiative. Um, federal agencies are going to default to inaction during this period unless you do the work of identifying a path that they can take through the regulatory thicket. Um, and I want to stress this period of uncertainty is going to last for quite a while, right? Because 
have the Biden administration doing its reconsideration. And then once that happens, you know, there's going to be some other rulemaking process in all likelihood. And then once that's concluded, you will have um, agency specific procedures and guidance that follow on after it. So, you know, we may be in this period of uncertainty for you know, a fair amount of time. Um, and unless your project is okay to just sort of sit around on the shelf during that period, you know, it's important to affirmatively engage and really try and take this on the front foot. Um, third, I guess, um, and I realize I'm sort of droning on here, but, you know, a lot of these decisions are going to be fact and context specific. And unfortunately, we're not with you as we record this. Hopefully next year we'll all be in the same room. Um, so, you know, please do feel free to reach out. We're happy to answer any uh, specific questions you may have. Um, let's see here. Okay, my turn for a question. Um, Sarah, from a fee to trust perspective, and this is something that you really focus on. You know, how do you see all of this playing out? Surely we're not going to pause all fee to trust activity until NEPA finds its footing. Yeah, well, that, that's a very good question. And the answer is I'm not entirely sure. I think mm -hmm. that what's going to be incredibly important for that fee to trust process um, are Department of Interior and Bureau of Indian Affairs procedures for carrying out um, their obligations under NEPA. Um, those procedures um, have been somewhat favorable and easy for tribes to follow um, in recent years. Uh, I have not heard much from either DOI or BIA on their agency-specific procedures. I would assume, especially given um, that this is the Bureau of Indian Affairs we're talking about with a very special relationship with tribal nations, that there will be some engagement with tribal stakeholders as they roll out new procedures and consider new procedures. So. Uh, I, I caution everybody out there to keep an eye out um, for any notices along those lines. I think, as Matt said, it might be some time, though, before we see any movement as we're watching the new administration, you know, take a second look at this, uh, at some of the actions of the Trump administration. We may be waiting for DOI and BIA um, to pull the trigger, so to speak, on, on their new procedures, um, waiting to determine if, if these regulations stick or if we see changes coming with the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, so that, that would be my best guess, all conjecture, uh, but. Well, uh, you know, along those lines, Matt, let me ask you a question that I think bears not only on the existing Bureau of Indian Affairs procedures, but procedures for other agencies that might um, be implicated here under the new regulations. Um, what about the process of borrowing categorical exclusion definitions or criteria from other agencies, not, you know, non-BIA um, procedures? Yeah, um, well, I think that's going to be an important part of the uh, rulemaking that you just referred to. So um, the issue is this. The former regulations considered categorical exclusions, CEs, to be an agency specific thing. In other words, an agency establishes its CE and then projects that come before the agency either fall within the CE or don't. Um, that has been a bit of a problem for projects in Indian country that touch on um, you know, non BIA approvals. So, for example, um, approvals that may be needed from the Forest Service. Um, one of the things to look out for, I think, is the possibility of um, borrowing CE, which is allowed under the 2020 amendments. So that, for example, um, BIA could borrow a Forest Service CE if that feels appropriate for the project that's being proposed. To me, that is a logical approach because it means that um, stakeholders will no longer be penalized um, based on you know, the specifics of their lead agency for a particular project, um, in my mind anyway. 
a tribe should have the benefit of forest service CEs if it wants to do some kind of forestry project, even if the BIA is technically the lead agency, right? Um, and so as the rulemaking that Sarah described um, proceeds, or maybe I should say if and as the rulemaking proceeds, um, keep a close eye on what DOI and BIA are saying about procedures for relying on CEs that have been adopted by other agencies. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, so we've been talking through sort of some nitty gritty um, and NEPA stuff, but pulling back to the big picture a little bit, I mean, Sarah, you mentioned you're not just a, a partner in Kaplan Kirsch, you're also a tribal leader. You know, from that perspective, what are you looking at um, in the way of engagement in NEPA proceedings under the 2020 amendments? I mean, do you see these as providing more and expanded opportunities, about the same opportunities, or do you see them as actually cutting the tribe, cutting tribal leadership or tribal government out of um, processes in any way? Well, you know, I think I think I'll answer that in the context of you know tribal um, tribal projects where the tribe is the pro project proponent. Um, mm -hmm. I actually think that there are many ways in which these regulations are helpful um, and and can be used to tribes' advantage. Um, one in particular, I think we've already um, noted, which is that tribal um, folks, so tribal in-house teams or tribes working directly with consultants, not through a consultant hired by the Bureau of Indian Affairs or, or other lead federal agency, um, can conduct the necessary environmental reviews. Um, this is really a big deal. Um, those That process can be incredibly time consuming and incredibly expensive. Most tribes do not have the resources to engage in um, very high level full NEPA analysis for projects, let's say, for instance, like one we're working on in IO, um, uh, you know, an elder housing project that isn't generating revenue, where there aren't any investment partners who are um, supporting the tribe with pre development funds. Um, it's, it's important for the process to be shortened and streamlined and made less costly. So, a tribe's ability to either conduct those processes and, and, um, and prepare those documents in house or to work directly with a consultant, again, not controlled by um, or directed by the federal agency is, is pretty significant. And I think um, cuts back on not only costs, but the time to get those projects done. So I see that as, um, I see that as incredibly useful and valuable and promising um, as you see tribes start to use their lands to develop more than just for-profit um, facilities like gaming enterprises, um, or other economic development goals um, of tribes that are outside of gaming. So uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see how that plays out in the short term and the long term and see how that's kind of looped into the Bureau of Indian Affairs and DOI um, agency specific procedures. I don't know, Matt, if you have thoughts on that from a, you know, uh, from a tribal stakeholder um, perspective yeah. <laughs> when the tribe's not the project proponent. Yeah, I, that's a good point. This might be one of those that uh, sort of cuts both ways, depending on circumstances. I mean, I, um, I, I hear you on the point about shortening the process and the importance of doing that in the context of, um, of tribal projects. I guess the concern on the on the flip side, um, since you asked about it, would be um, you know what happens in a situation where the tribe is an important stakeholder in a process that could impact tribal resources that are not on trust, not on lands that the tribe owns or controls in any way. You know, in that context, you know, I think tribes normally use NEPA as a tool to try to um, minimize the impact to the resources that they care about. Um, and they have come to expect appropriately um, you know, that their government to government relationship with the United States will translate to a special role in the NEPA process. And I guess the open question is, how does that work in the context of a NEPA document that's being prepared by a project proponent rather than the United States? Um, and I think that's gonna be an important thing to nail down, um, certainly going forward. 
Well, Matt, as we're wrapping up our discussion on these regulations and what tribes can, you know, can expect or should be looking out for moving forward, is there anything else that you think is worth noting before before we wrap up and turn this over for question and answer? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess the one thing we haven't touched on is the, the note at the bottom of the screen there, tribal environmental regulation. I mean, that to me is something that has not gotten nearly enough attention in this batch of 2020 um, regulatory amendments. As you said earlier, you know, the former regulations had a series of specific criteria for determining significance, which is really at the heart of figuring out how to comply with NEPA. Um, one of those criteria um, was, will this action threaten to violate um, any sort of uh, state, local, or federal um, standard imposed for the protection of the environment? Um, to that has now been added, you know, or tribal regulation <laughs> imposed for the protection of the environment. And that suggests to me that there are um, you know, going to be ways for tribes to use their inherent regulatory authority um, to sort of create a regulatory framework that then allows them a little bit more leverage in the NEPA process, even if that NEPA process is run by the United States or even a private project proponent. Um, and so I would encourage folks to think creatively about that and whether it opens up opportunities you know, in the circumstances that, uh, that are facing you. I think that does it for our presentation, um, or at least the recorded part. Um, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to be with you today um, and uh, hope that we can do it again in person before long and look forward to your questions. Um, both in the context of this uh, proceeding and just more generally, you can always feel free to, to reach out to either one of us. Yeah, thank you.